So today's message is titled "The Great Faith of the Centurion." t e verse is verse nine. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and uh, turning to the crowd following him, he said, "I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel." Let me pray, dear Father. Please be with us, Father. Help us to have your image. And Father, remember this nation and each of us, so that we can be faithful disciples of Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. On Tuesday, May 24th, around 12 days ago, Pastor Ron and I arrived in Seattle to join a world mission forum. A pastor of the host church pick, picked, up, uh, picked us up at the airport and gave us a ride to the hotel where we would stay. When we were close to the hotel, we stopped for lunch at a teriyaki restaurant in Seattle. After ordering food, we sat at table and heard the news from the TV of the restaurant. Active shooter reported at Rob Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. 19 kids and two teachers killed. Can you please put the slide? So what? I was just so surprised. 19 kids and two teachers were killed. We were very shocked. at the news. As a father of two children, I felt very sad about the lives of our young children who became victims and felt sympathy for their parents. How can this kind of a massacre happen in this country? I thought. But in reality, this kind of a massacre has happened at the supermarket in Buffalo. New York, just 10 days before the shooting in Texas. On May 14, the 10 black people were killed, and the three others were injured by an 18-year-old white man who described himself as an ethno-nationalist sporting white supremacy. It was a hate crime against the black community. that retains unforgettable memories in American history. We reject racial discrimination. We speak up for the equality of all people. Pastor Teddy expressed the pain of his church community for the Buffalo racist attack through an email saying, the Trident UBF chapter dedicated Last Sunday worship service, May 22nd, as a prayer, lament, and an outcry against the racially motivated killings in Buffalo, New York, last week. We wanted to grieve alongside the African-American families of our own chapter, as well as all our North America, African-American UBF family. and to share with them in their anguish, concern, and outrage over racially motivated violence in the nation. It was a so painful time. However, it seems that crime and violence don't stop in this nation. Why? I believe that it is because people of our society lost a Christian value that all humans are the bearers of the image of God. During the last three weeks, we learned the sermon on the plane that is a magna carta for the disciples of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus are very beautiful, but very difficult to practice. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. It is so difficult. As the disciples of Jesus Christ, 
We must grow spiritually to the point of loving our enemies, doing good to those who hate us, blessing those who curse us, and praying for those who mistreat us. This is the way of disciples. If all people in the world practice the word of Jesus as his disciples, we will see different world. We will restore the image of God in us. And we, this world will be changed, transformed to be a kingdom of God. Really, this is our desire, our hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I think that it is not an accident that we have the story of the centurion right after the sermon on the plain of Jesus in Luke's gospel. Even though he was, not a, Ro he was a Roman official and he was not a disciple of Jesus, he had the image of God. And he revealed the love of God to his neighbors. He was not a perfect man. However, really we can find image of God from his story. We can learn two important things from the story of the centurion. First, the image of God was revealed to the centurion. Second, great faith in Jesus was revealed to the centurion. First, the image of God was revealed to the centurion. When Jesus entered Capernaum, Capernaum a centurion, the servant, was sick and about to die. When you read Matthew chapter, five, verse, chapter 8, verse 5, he laid at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. He was uh, paralyzed. We don't know what had happened with the servant. Maybe he fell from the roof, roof of the master's house while repairing it, and he got paralyzed. Anyway, he couldn't work anymore. And he was about to die. Greek word, dolos, means a slave, rather than servant. It means that he was a slave in those times. In the Roman world, slaves were subject to the absolute power of their owners and experienced a kind of a social death. They were separated from their families, tribes, identities, sense of honor and dignity, self-determination over their bodies and the time, and the legal protection enjoyed by free persons. Slaves were regarded as a property of their masters and could be abandoned if they were sick. In other hand, a centurion held a position in the Roman army, nominally in command of 100 soldiers. They were usually career soldiers and formed the real backbone of the Roman military force. Soldiers needed to be merciless and inhumane because they should kill their enemies in battle. Can you imagine that? If soldiers are very merciful, they don't want to kill anyone, anybody, their enemies in a war. What will happen? He will be killed, right? And uh, he, their people will lose the war. I joined the army in Korea to perform my duty for 26 months. But I was so sentimental that I had a lot of internal conflict, thinking that, oh, how can I kill a North Korean young man? Who could be a good friend of mine? If I meet him, a colleague as a classmate, wow, I cannot, I will not shoot them. It was my idea before going to military. But the military trainers didn't allow me to be weak or sentimental. They trained me very hard and they often shouted at me, gave me physical punishment and they they trained me in many things, and I was changed in a very short time. <laughs> and I was ready to shoot enemies and kill them if a war broke out. 
I think the centurion who created Percy, also he had to kill enemies in battle. You know, the Roman soldier, they are very cruel. However, in the middle of everything, he didn't lose love for others. He was not violent nor dis disrespectful like many other centurions. He highly valued his slave. And he felt very worried about him when he was sick and about to die. He could have just abandon his slave as many others did, but he didn't do it because he loved his slave. The centurion's love for his slave was not just theoretical but practical. When he heard of Jesus, he sent some elders of the Jews to Jesus, asking him to come and heal his slave. Really, it was not easy that a Roman centurion asked a favor of the Jewish elders. Not easy. He abandoned all his uh, personal pride to serve, to save his slave. I think that he had, he had tried many other ways to heal his slave, but it didn't work. Finally, he heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to, to him to heal his slave. The centurion really respected the life of his slave because he respected human life itself. His love of others was revealed not only for his slave, but also for the people of Israel, a colonized nation by the Roman Empire. As a Roman official, the centurion had authority over the Jewish community of his, his region, and he could oppress them with the colonizing power of his empire. But he didn't exercise military power over the colonized people. On the contrary, he loved the Israelites and helped them with his authority. He respected the God of Israel and he built a synagogue for them. Probably he had to give his own money to support construction. He was a very nice man. He loved, his love for the Jewish people was genuine, and the elders of the Jews in his region felt his love of the nation of Israel. So the centurion and the elders of the Jews had a very good relationship. Can you imagine? These are colonizing power and the colonized people. They had a good relationship because the centurion really loved them. Thus, when the centurion asked a favor of them, they willingly accepted it and went to Jesus to ask his help. It was not easy for the elders to ask a favor of Jesus, but they pleaded earnestly with Jesus, saying, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. They had a very good reference. Centurion really had a very good reference from the elders of Jews. Furthermore, the centurion respected the Jewish culture and the tradition. He sent some elders of the Jews to Jesus, asking him to come and heal his servant. When you read Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, you can see that centurion came to Jesus directly. But I think that Luke described this story in more detail than Matthew, so actually he sent the elders. And why didn't he go to Jesus directly? Some may think that the centurion had authority to order Jesus to come to his house through sending some elders, but it is not true. The centurion explained it by sending his friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. He was a very humble man. 
He felt that he didn't deserve to have Jesus come under his roof. Do you know why? Because he was a Gentile, while Jesus was a Jew. The Jews didn't enter the homes of Gentiles in observance of their law and tradition. The centurion understood the Jewish tradition and he respected it. He respected the Jewish culture. The centurion understood the Jewish, he understood the Jewish tradition and he humbled himself before Jesus, saying that he didn't deserve to have Jesus come under his roof. It's very interesting to see that he felt undeserving, while the Jewish elders said that the centurion deserved to receive the help of Jesus. Do you see that? He himself was feeling that he was undeserving. Even he deserved. Really, he was a humble man. The centurion was a man who loved and respected his slave, as well as, well as the colonized people. His story makes us ruminate about our own society. Many people in our society associate slaves with whom? Black people. This is because of American history of slavery that began in 1619 when 20 Africans were landed into, in, in the English colony of Virginia. This is a starting point. But in the, in the Greek, Greek Roman world of the time of Jesus, neither skin color nor ethnic racial origins indicated the slave status in the population of the Roman Empire. They couldn't really distinguish slaves by their skin color. Anibal Quijano, a Peruvian sociologist, states that after the colonization of America and the expansion of European colonialism to the rest of the world, race and racial identity were established as instruments of basic social classification which means that after that moment, people began to classify people, white people, black people, yellow people, something. This kind of a racial classification came from there. Even after the Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863, during the Civil War, the racial discrimination by skin color has been one of the most critical problems in American society, as we just experienced through the massacre made by the hate crime in Buffalo. After the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, anti-Asian hate crime increased by 239% in 2021 in America. 239%. One month ago, a 60-year-old Asian woman was punched to the ground by a stranger in New York City. It was not the first case in New York, and the city became notorious for anti-Asian hate crime. In those days, one month ago, my daughter had to visit Korean consulate in Manhattan, New York, by herself to renew her passport. She wanted to go to Manhattan by subway from the express bus terminal, but my wife and I, we didn't allow her to go there by subway. Because of an anti-Asian environment in the city, this is the reality of our American society. But how can we build up a new society? where people love and respect each other, how we can expect a new society where there is really respect one another. How could a centurion be a man who loved and respected others? 
we can assume that he was a God-fearing man because he loved the Jewish nation and built the synagogue. Probably he read the Jewish scripture and got to know the God of Israel. We don't know exactly, but we can guess. Most importantly, he had the image of God, Imago Dei, Imago Dei Latin, Imago image of God, as a human created by God. All humans, regardless of their faith, their social position, their race, and ethnicity, their gender, etc., have the image of God. Because all of us, we were created by God, and we have the same dignity as the bearers of God's image. This is a biblical value. This is a Christian value. In fact, the consequence of sin is that the glory of the image of God is diminished. The image of God is settled and destroyed by sin. But it doesn't have to remain broken. We have, a, we have a new way. Because God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to the world to save all humanity and restore the image of God in each of us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. This is Jesus, why, why Jesus came to the world. What is a discipleship? What is it to be a disciple of Jesus? To be a disciple of Jesus means to restore the image of God in us, in each of us. Therefore, those who know God really realize that the image of God is in him and in her. And to find his or her own dignity and world before creator. So those who know God know that he was made by God. He has a dignity of God. He will do or she will do best in their lives to, glory, to glorify God. And their lives will be very fruitful, very happy in God. Furthermore, they can love and respect each other as the same bearers of the image of God. Hate crime. Hostility cannot exist in our society. If we restore the Imago Dei and we recognize the Imago Dei in others, if we respect each other because each one has the image of God, so the division, discrimination we see in humanity due to race, ethnicity, class, or gender will be steadily broken down. When we read and obey the word of God, we live by the word of God. The word of God says, there is a neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Therefore, you should be faithful disciples of Jesus through obeying his word. Through obeying his word. We learned already this beautiful, beautiful sermon on the plain. We have a very amazing word of God. We have to love the word of God. We have to read it. We have to meditate in. We have to try, struggle to change ourselves. Really for the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be transformed. We can be new, new being. Actually, Jesus already changed us to be new being, but we need this process of uh, sanctification, process of uh, imitating Jesus always in our lives through the word of God and the prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit. Then God will transform our lives. God will transform our society. 
to be a kingdom of priest, holy nation. God can transform this nation to be sepulchre nation. Actually, in our nation, America can be different if we have this value in God. And really, we are, we, we, we imitate, we have an image of God in us. Second, great faith in Jesus was revealed through the centurion. Real greatness of the centurion comes from his genuine faith in Jesus. When he heard of Jesus, who had healed a paralyzed man, a small seed of faith was planted in his heart. It was small. But his mind was filled with hope on Jesus, thinking that his servant also could be healed by the power of Jesus. His faith, faith was not static. It was a dynamic. He appealed to some elders of Jews to meet Jesus and ask him to come and heal his servant. He believed that his servant could be healed if Jesus would come to his home and raise him up. He had faith. Meanwhile, as Jesus was coming to his home, after accepting the plea of the elders, the centurion meditated more on Jesus. He was thinking, who is this man? Jesus. Already he asked the elders, Jesus was coming. But he was, uh, he kept thinking, who is Jesus? And he realized that, and with the, with the work of the Holy Spirit, his eyes were opened, and he realized that Jesus was the commander in chief who had the supreme power over the universe. Wow. He is a commander. As he was an official of the Roman army, he could perfectly understand the power of the word of the commander. In this way, his faith grew to blossom. He believed Jesus that he could heal his servant just by saying word because he was a commander. So, and he, he really accepted that the word of Jesus had the power. So, Centurion immediately sent his friends to say to Jesus, but say the word, just say the word, my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority, with the soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, I, and the dead one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Just say the word. My servant will be healed. He had amazing faith. Jesus was amazed at his faith and immediately healed his servant. The centurion's faith bore fruit of experiencing the healing power of Jesus on his servant. We can learn two important things through the great faith of a centurion. Number one, the faith of a centurion was alive and growing. His faith was growing. The small seed of faith planted in his heart sprouted, blossomed, and bore fruit to the point of experiencing the healing power of Jesus. His faith grew so great that Jesus was amazed at him. How could this happen to him? It was because he heard of Jesus. It was because he meditated on Jesus. It was because he kept his eyes on Jesus. He was thinking on Jesus and through the work of the Holy Spirit, he could realize, he could know who was Jesus really. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. 
our faith in Jesus can grow. No, must grow. Our faith in Jesus must grow. This faith can grow when we hear the word of God. We get to know Jesus more and more. How, our, how can our faith can grow when we know Jesus more and more? The more we know Jesus, the stronger will be our faith in Jesus. We should love the word of God. We should pray more. We should, we should seek Jesus. We have to know who is Jesus more and more. And we have to pray deeply to get to know Jesus better through the work of the Holy Spirit. We will be very sad if our faith don't grow, doesn't grow. As a small child doesn't grow, we will be very sad. The same way, we will be very sad if our faith doesn't grow. Our faith needs to grow always, as we need to know Jesus more and more. So we need to seek Jesus. We can pray, we can read the Bible personally, and it's good. Also, I think it's good that we can read the Bible communally, and we can pray together, because we can be more encouraged to know Jesus more and more. We have some programs, and, uh, but yeah, maybe I'm advertising some program, but I designed some program. You know, but what was my real desire to make a loving and loving and a growing community in Jesus together? Through the word of God, all our community here, there are different groups of uh, reading the Bible together, different groups of uh, daily bread together, Different groups of uh, praying together, running. So this our if our community can be a running community, running Jesus together, this is very beautiful. So we can grow. We can know Jesus more and more. Our faith can grow also. So let's pray that so that we really grow in faith in Jesus to know him more and more. Number two, the faith of the centurion grew because he contextualized his faith in Jesus. Contextualized means internalized, personalized his faith in Jesus. He tried to understand that faith meant, what faith meant to him and found that faith was the power of the word of Jesus in the light of his personal experiences as a Roman soldier. Actually, he, when he engaged this uh, faith in Jesus with his experience as a Roman soldier, he could understand perfectly what does it mean faith. He could understand really what he had to do to experience the power of Jesus. Our God, as each of us has a different life experiences in different cultural situations, growth environment, our God will reveal himself to us differently according to our own life experiences. So it's very important to see God, really to connect God with your experience of your life. For example, my life, I had my own different experiences. I was born in South Korea and I was an atheist, which means that I didn't believe God. My context different from many people in America already believed God. However, when I met Jesus, my conversion was very radical. I changed from here there and very radically. And I have this great uh, like, uh, experience of a conversion is very different from some people. And also I was in Venezuela. I was very exposed to Latin American Pentecostal church practices. <laughs> So, you know, and I'm very, my faith is very passionate sometimes. My faith is very emotional rather than racial. Why? Reasonable. Why? Yeah, because of my context, Latin America, and sometimes my preaching is <laughs> shouting. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it's because of my life. And also, I came to America, and I studied theology at the Evangelical Theological Seminary in America. I and I was disciplined 
with the different issues in American society. And I'm very sensitive to the social justice and equality of American society, humanity in general. So this is why I spoke much about our, the image of God this morning. Yeah, this is my faith. This is how I am growing in my faith. And each of us, we need to grow in different ways, maybe in their different life experiences, but connecting Jesus, contextualizing the faith and the personalizing and the really internalizing this faith in your life, life itself, then you can grow. And you can understand more Jesus, you can grow more in God and your faith be stronger. Jesus was amazed at the great faith of the centurion. Turning to the crowd following him, Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Wow, Jesus was amazed. Jesus commanded the centurion's faith to encourage his followers to have a great faith like him. Interesting is that there were two times when Jesus was amazed. In the, in, in gospel books, two times, you know, one is this time when Jesus, he, Jesus was amazed at the faith of a centurion. Do you know what is the other time? Jesus was amazed at the unbelief, the lack of faith of people of his hometown. Jesus was amazed by faith, at, at, at faith and unbelief. How do you want to amaze Jesus? By faith or by unbelief? Really, we really we can really when when our faith grows, and we can really please our God. Hebrews chapter eleven verse six says, "And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him." So I pray that may God bless each of us so that we get to know Jesus more and more, and our faith can grow more and more in Jesus, and we can please God, and we can have the image of God. We can be true disciples of Jesus Christ. God bless you.